computer. Well, good morning, everyone. And here we are uh, on November the 2nd. We're just getting out of Halloween and Day of the Dead and All Souls Day. Um, and happy all those and any other science fictional birthdays you might know of famous science fiction writers, so, which I didn't remember to look up. So um, I first of all, before I introduce the guests, which we're so happy to have, I would like to just do our utility slides. And the first one is, who are we? And now if I can find my advanced slide, I will just use a down arrow, see if that works most of <clears throat> I'm gonna use an arrow here. One of these will work. Okay, I am not finding the arrow that works. Be patient, everyone. I'm, I'm assuming there is a, an advanced. I, there always has been. Everything has to go out on you at some point. Oh, there it is. And I went too far. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Must have been lag. Our etiquette is please turn off your microphone and your, your visual unless you're speaking. And, and especially during the presentation, um, remove your face from the corner. Uh, and place your comments during the presentation. You can comment, place it into the chat window and that will allow, I will try to see them in real time. And um, if it's very important, ask our speaker. If you want more information on the speaker, you can contact me here or he may have his own uh, contact for you. And finally, I want to say that we do have a theater group who are putting together yet another presentation called The Terror Out of Space by Lee Brackett. And it should be done fairly soon. Um, they're, they're in the final stages. What we do is we read in Zoom like this, and then we add animations. And it's not totally animated, but you can see the crystal egg. Just look it up on YouTube that we did. It's what they call anima animatics. It's partially animated. And we are always looking for people that either work in tech and can help with the animations or who want to read. So contact me at that previous, at sci-fi 2111 at gmail.com if you want to work with our Planet Zoom players. So with that, I will stop my slides and turn it over. Oh, and I will tell about our speaker. Our speaker is an astronomer at the University of, do we say Glasgow or Glasgow? Glasgow. Glasgow. In, uh, should I say Scotland or the UK? <laughs> Scotland, it's, yeah, Scotland or the UK, either one. All right. He's either in Scotland or the UK and possibly like that Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat, you know, hovering between the two. So here is our speaker and we're so proud to have Hugh Hudson. Thank you. I'm just setting the uh, the recording. Uh, well, it isn't coming up with the on the three, but oh, it has to start recording. Okay. Okay, okay. I never had stopped it, so I'm going to share. Okay, here's the share, and there's my presentation. Can people see it? Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. So I will introduce myself as well a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm Hugh Hudson, and I'm an author of the author of a paper on the Carrington event, which nobody has to read, but it, probably that's how I got into this. And I'm also a, a uh, not a current fan of science fiction, but I, I have some science fiction history that I'll describe as we go along. And I, I am a solar astronomer, but I was trained as a physicist. Uh, and I will short and I'll immediately give you my pedigree uh, but this is the this is the all out of what I want to talk about what is a Carrington event what is an event in the first place how we can use tree rings and stellar flares to help us learn about uh, Carrington events and then putting Carrington events uh, into the context of disasters uh, could, could an extreme event uh, caused by the sun or related to the sun somehow smite us and destroy civilization as we know it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so at the end of this uh, slide I just made 15 minutes ago, I have a suggestion for a thing that might 
the sun might do to us. And I'm wondering if it's a new suggestion, uh, maybe some other science fiction uh, historian would know uh, whether or not this idea has come up before. But anyway, there's a possibility of a new idea. Okay, so proceeding. Oh yeah, so to put myself in context, in, in the sense of the last week's speaker, Hamlet said to be or not to be, an optician might say to see or not to see, but an astronomer says 2D or not 2D. And what that means is um, we see the sky in two dimensions. And so not three, but this, but everything out there that's useful has got three dimensions or who knows how many, and we can't see them. So we can't do experiments. We can't make contact with the things that we study. And for that reason, we're always kind of slipshod or or approximate in our approach to the to scientific credibility so we're we're ready for science fiction in the in the world of astronomy i think for sure so okay so that's a bit of a joke all right so this is my academic pedigree i was an undergraduate at rice in graduating in 61 went to berkeley for a phd studied under kenzie anderson that's him there with a glass of wine and his, that's his thesis advisor. That's his thesis advisor next next door to Einstein. There's uh, Röntgen, who is his thesis advisor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're back to a long line of miscellaneous German chemists. And so you can do this on Wikipedia. You can track your pedigree, uh, even if you're not famous as a rule. Okay, so in science fiction, uh, it's different. Uh, it, I was a great fan of science fiction when I was a teenager, apparently. So that in those th those years, 1950 through 59, roughly speaking, and I read all of Heinlein, Asimov, Bradbury, and every issue of the amazing or astounding, amazing stories or astounding science fiction or whatever, plus anthologies of short stories that I could get a hold of. Then I seem to have gone to college in 1957 and it must have been at that point that I stopped reading science fiction. Uh, so I must have been mostly reading science because I had to pass. And I did, however, squeeze in one or two books that I'll mention to you that I disliked. And one was The Lord of the Rings, and one was Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. I read those when I was a college student. Uh, but not have, but since that time, uh, I've not had much time for, for novels, and so I haven't really read very much. However... Uh, after Berkeley, I went to UC San Diego, and I was a postdoc there uh, for nine, for 25 years, actually. And so during that time, or the earlier part of that time, I met several authors, science fiction authors. Werner Wenge was a friend. Uh, David Brin was there. Greg Benford uh, got his PhD in 1967. Uh, and I think you know the names of these people. Uh, and that was uh, interesting for me because Vern, for one, asked me a very simple question uh, about the physics of something he was about to, to write a story about, and I gave him a totally wrong physics answer, even though I was a physics PhD. So, so that uh, woke, woke me up a little bit in terms of uh, the real world. I mean, how can you if, you, if you're a physicist and you get the basic physics wrong, what's the point? So anyway, so that was a, a pleasure for me to know those people. And then the next thing that is really relevant here is that in 1991, I actually wrote a, a scientific paper, which was semi a joke, almost like a joke, called, the title was, A Space Parasol as a Countermeasure Against the Greenhouse Effect. And that was published in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society in 1991. And so uh, this uh, was not a new idea, it turned out. I learned later on that it had previously been published in the very same journal, uh, by an author whose name was Early, <laughs> so so I, I didn't cite his paper, but and also I think there was other other ideas like this floating around. The greenhouse effect was a an important thing at San Diego in 1991 uh, because of the, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography being the uh, site of the analysis, the chemical analysis of carbon dioxide in the solar in the Earth's atmosphere, the global warming. Uh, you know, Canary is telling us about the uh, increase of uh, gr uh, greenhouse effect grass gases and possible future disaster. At that point, there was kind of a quote from a senior geophysicist, uh, Roger Revell at San Diego, who said, uh, I think it was in 19, about 19, 
85 or something like that, he said, we're embarked on an experiment. This is when he first saw the increase of the CO2 that was being done uh, in Hawaii at Mauna Loa. He said in this article that uh, we're human, the human race has embarked upon an experiment and we don't know what the outcome will be. <laughs> so, so we still have, are in that situation, I'm afraid. Okay, so this uh, space parasol was a cosmetic idea for a cosmetic uh, measure and it's of, to, of no use whatsoever. And it was cited recently, this paper was cited recently by somebody who correctly uh, dismissed it as fantasy. Uh, but I'm also reading a paper, a book that I'll mention later on in which the same idea comes up. Okay, so uh, Carrington. Carrington was a, an English astronomer, an amateur astronomer uh, in this kind of the traditional style of the of the gentleman, the, the wealthy, independently wealthy gentleman who likes science and does pioneering stuff. And he worked very hard at it. For, for about 10 years, he was really the, you know, the leading astronomer, probably in Victorian England, or maybe anywhere in the world at that time. And you can see uh, the measure of the man because this, this is a bookshelf in the Royal Astronomical Society uh, a photograph taken by Ed Cliver, my friend who wrote a paper about this. And you can see that the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society are going along regularly until they come to the Carrington era, which is about 1850 to 1860, 1855, 65 maybe. And at that time they had to enlarge enlarge the journal to to fit him in. <laughs> so, so once he had departed the scene, uh, not without some really interesting, fascinating personal history, Kind of and drama actually. The, so the the uh, the biography of Carrington that uh, is called uh, Sol the Solar Kings or something like that. Uh, if anybody wants to know about that, I can point you to the biography. It's quite interesting his life, and uh, it ended I think shortly after the famous event that he discovered. Okay. So he well, who was he not? This picture. Uh, here is a picture of Lord Kelvin, and uh, he's leaning on a binnacle, which is a which is holding a ship's compass. He, this was a, a, an amazing physicist who also was a very practical man, and invented numerous things involved with submarine cables and binnacles, and and uh, uh, was also capable of doing the the, the most exotic kind of theory. Uh, and he was contemporaneous, you know, with many people of the nineteenth century who were uh, great great physicists like uh, Helmholtz and, and uh, Maxwell and, and people of that sort. But he wasn't a lord. So he's frequently, uh, this picture is frequently shown in the solar literature as a picture of Carrington, but this is not him. And he was not also not a Lord Carrington, which is also often uh, uh, thought incorrectly. There was a Lord Carrington, but he was a, a British politician also of the 19th century and not related to our Carrington. And the interesting, another interesting fact about him is that there is no known likeness of the man himself. We don't know what he looked like, although photography existed then. This is a, a, a group of pictures that, again, Ed Cliver brought together of a, of a circle of signatories of a round robin letter, a kind of a, a, an invitation to record photographs of the, of the, of the members of this circle. And so here are some many, many famous uh, Astronomers George Airy, Warren de la Rue, uh, Fisher, Glacier, Lee, Maine, May, Paragall, Pritchard, William Smythe. And so, but, and Carrington was here, but there's no picture. So to this day, we don't know what his face actually looked like. And uh, so possibly out there somewhere there is a, a uh, picture, and but possibly he was just superstitious about this and just always avoided that. Okay, so what did he do? Uh, he was a, a pioneer of studying the sun, and, and uh, one basic kind of now prosaic thing that he did was to, to measure sunspots. So he would make exact sketches via projection onto what he called a screen of a pale distemper of straw. That's the color, and you can see the color here. This picture was taken by uh, of the original an original drawing he made by Sue Prosser, who was the librarian at the Royal Astronom Astronomical Society. And this is a picture, this is his sketch from the day of the flare that he saw. And this active region uh, up here, the sunspot group you see there, 
I think, can people see my little cursor? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, so, I can see. By the way, as, as I drone on, uh, please do ask questions because it's, it's uh, much more fun for me when people do that. So uh, if you wish, or, or feed them through the chat and Maria can ask them. Okay, so here's the picture that he was drawing. And what he was doing was measuring very precisely the locations of the spots and their shapes and sizes. And he did this routinely every day for a long time. And so, and as, as you know, the sun rotates and the spots move across the face of the sun. And what he was able to put his measurements together and, and uh, compute the location of the rotation axis of the motion that caused the sunspots to move the rotation axis of the sun. And the uh, the parameters that he derived from his observations were still in use uh, in the space age, actually. In the 1990s, people would use the, the Carrington elements, they were called as a reference for the solar coordinate system. So his impact was uh, lasting, and he was a very good scientist, for sure. And, and while he was watching this particular spot group, while he was sketching it, I think, maybe even, uh, the flare popped off. And of course, nobody had ever seen a flare before. Uh, what he saw in that spot group in, on the same sketch, just resketched by uh, a, uh, what was his name? Um, German geophysicist, uh, uh, Bartels, Julius Bartels. What he saw was these little uh, kidney-shaped things, four little, little brightenings, A, B, C, and D, tiny, tiny things, because this, and you can see the solar grid there, zero degrees, 20 degrees, 40 degrees of longitude. So they were quite compact and quite small, but they were brilliantly bright, so bright, in fact, that he thought they were as bright as the sun itself. So uh, based upon that, one could actually, uh, do some calculations and the uh, the flare I said I have a few slides here about what is the flare because he found he he saw it right in 1859 this was really unexpected and of course it was not explicable we didn't even use the term flare until much much later and uh, even more remarkable than the fact that there was this flare a neighbor of his another amateur astronomer also saw it <laughs> so so uh, he was uh, confirmed immediately. And so he made a presentation in the Royal Astronomical Society and you know, wrote this up. And he was able to, uh, to be believed because he actually had uh, confident support. And, but the, and additionally, remarkably, there was a simultaneous perturbation of the Earth's magnetic field, also unexpected and also inexplicable. And so now we know this is a form of multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, it had already begun in in other ways on the sun, on the Earth, but here was what we, what we now call space weather actually inaugurated. And uh, the Earth's magnetic field, as you no doubt know, uh, is pretty stable. I mean, it's there's a gigantic uh, dynamo in the, in the core of the Earth, and it's uh, steady except not completely. And uh, precise measurements show that there are little fluctuations all the time with lots of explanations, including the solar explanation. And I'll get to this in a second, but first I'll show you the pictures of what's going on. Um, the flare is this bright thing that's uh, this particular snap has. This is a picture from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, the AIA instrument on board. It's the current, a current source of, of, of images, rich images all the time. Every 12 seconds there, six images in different uh, UV wavelengths, ultraviolet wavelengths, and, and visible light. And so uh, when a flare happens, it, the whole sun is being recorded. And you can see this bright thing here with diffraction spikes sticking out and saturation. So at the, at the UV, it isn't, isn't just as bright as the sun itself, but it's much, much brighter. The flare is much, much brighter than the sun itself. And so you have your CCD in space, Gloria, this is a CCD in space, and it saturates uh, if you don't get the exposure right. So uh, at the same time that a flare like this happens, you see a, you often see a coronal mass ejection. And so here on this picture on the lower left, 
the sun is reduced to this scale. And that's another EUV picture of the sun. And here's a coronagraph picture of the CME that's coming out, coming based upon this point here, I suppose. So here, the CME is a coronal mass ejection, so it's it's seen against the dark sky. Uh, this inner annulus of dark. What, excuse me, could you repeat what CME is? Coronal mass ejection. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, counter, so, so I, I made a joke for my colleagues. Uh, these coronal mass ejections can be seen with uh, electrons in solar wind. <laughs> you can you can detect them because the electrons go in opposite directions sometimes. And so I said, really, the coronal mass ejection is not a coronal mass ejection because it comes from the chromosphere, and it's not a mass ejection because it's magnetic, um, and it's really not an ejection because to make th this happen you have to have an implosion as i will probably explain so I, instead I, we should call a cme a counter marching electrons <laughs> so 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 the the boffins uh, like that a lot i think okay so anyway this is the this is a uh, very important uh, because of uh, geo effectiveness they call it the cme actually does contain mass as well as magnetism and it comes out and hits the earth and it makes a magnetic storm and this sketch here is showing you roughly how that happens on the sun. There's this, and this is a nice aspect of this particular cartoon. There is this twisted structure of magnetic field. And I'll come in, I'll describe the physics of this a little bit later, a little bit more. But this uh, twisted structure becomes unstable and may or may not blow up. When it does blow up, you get this coronal mass ejection. You can often have a flare without a coronal mass ejection. And, uh, but if you do, then that material flies out uh, radially from the sun and, and bashes the earth and it makes a, a geomagnetic storm. So now I think my next slide will show, uh, will it show, let's see, what will it show? Uh, yes, it doesn't show anything, it just tells you words, okay. So briefly, uh, just to summarize, the flare shows the sudden release of magnetic energy in other forms. And at this point, I want to describe to you what magnetic energy is, because this is a fundamental invention of the 19th century in physics by Maxwell. Um, it, it turns out that there's more in space than just things. There is, all, there is also fields, and the electromagnetic field is one of these fields. And the fields are, are pervasive. They they fill all of the universe. Uh, in the case of the of the electromagnetic field, which Maxwell described correctly, it's uh, it's basically magnetism and electricity. All right, you know, electric current flowing and magnetic field sticking things together. And so this uh, presence of this field uh, in space means that there is some storage of energy in space under certain conditions, uh, just in, in a given volume. If you have this field with certain properties, then it contains energy and it can release it. So uh, a solar flare or a CME consists of uh, just that, uh, the, the solar magnetic field, which is made on the interior of the sun, but expands into the atmosphere of the sun. This magnetic field has the property of twist, which is, the, which is indicating that there is energy storage and that energy storage can have an instability, so it can it can, it can suddenly fall to a lower energy state and release the flare and CME energy. Okay, so uh, in fact, the CME mass can go right out into the void uh, forever, and so it's a it's truly a, a mass ejection kind of thing. So let me go back. Yeah, I told you that already. I showed you that already. I go to this, and space weather is those latter, latter two bullets. Uh, okay, so this is the record. This is from Kew Gardens in London in 1859, and the very fortuitous occurrence of this magnetic deflection of the, of the compass or the magnetometer was only possible because about a year before the flare, uh, a new instrument had been installed at Kew Gardens to record fluctuations. To record fluctuations. I mean, you could already see compass needles flickering and people who've been studying them for, for decades. But uh, this invention allowed people to record uh, for all time 
the the, the record of the of the fluctuations. And these these records are still available. And we're, I'm just worked up working on an analysis of them uh, at this at this very moment, except not right now, but tomorrow. And so let me describe a little bit. It's a little bit confusing. This is a uh, uh, what is this? This is three the three vector components of the field x, y, and z, but not exactly x, y, and z, uh, and three components that they called in those days the west declination, the horizontal force, and the vertical force. And this terminology was archaic and, and uh, went out, but the, but the essence is still there. You still see on three consecutive days, August 30, August 31, September 1, you can see the pattern in each of these components that there is kind of a, a slow variation with some some small uh, fluc flickering fluctuations, but then at the time of the flare, exactly there was this this thing right here, and it was uh, obvious, that, although small, it was quite clear, and it appeared in all three of the components, and uh, it was sort of dis disdainfully uh, dismissed as a crotchet, as a little crotchet in the magnetic field, uh, and that uh, was about the the whole story. Our Lord Kelvin said that this can't possibly be, be solar in origin because the solar magnetic field can't extend to the Earth. It's physically impossible. And he was right. So this is not uh, the solar magnetic field that's making this perturbation. Now we know that it's the Earth's Earth currents in the ionosphere. But uh, they weren't to know about that in 1859 because the uh, these currents in the ionosphere are caused by X-rays coming from the sun. They didn't know what an X-ray was. In fact, they didn't know what an ionosphere was either. So, so this mechanism uh, uh, just was you know beyond them. And so, after this flare, even though this striking coincidence uh, was there, nobody uh, worked. Nobody saw another flare for another uh, ten or twelve years. And so, it only gradually became clear that something really remarkable was happening. And uh, it was not, uh, it didn't escape notice, of course, because this, this crotchet here preceded this huge geomagnetic storm. Uh, and that, this storm is where aurorae form, what causes aurora, and uh, direct, you know, indirectly. And so uh, in this case, the aurora was seen amazingly uh, far from the, from the auroral zone, which is normally, you know, in northern Canada and, and uh, Finland and places like that. Uh, it was seen in Havana, for example. So, so it was quite a remarkable, remarkable geomagnetic storm. And uh, let me fumble up here. And there was an American astronomer, uh, Loomis, who actually uh, wrote many papers about this back in back in the time, pointing out these extreme uh, signatures of this of this uh, event that was seen around the world in places where you wouldn't normally see aurorae or things of that sort. So uh, this is the device. This is the device that the Balfour Stewart installed at Kew Gardens, and you have to imagine this is like a steampunk kind of thing. You have to imagine that the the wooden parts here are made of mahogany, and the uh, the metal parts are made of polished brass, and it, it's got a clockwork. You see the clockwork uh, sort of the weights and the pendulum here. And the artist who drew this was very meticulous because you could see that even the cracked floor tiles are being recorded, faithfully recorded. So what? How does this work? It works with uh, delicately suspended compasses, needles, uh, under low friction conditions. That can that can contain mirrors that hold support mirrors, and the mirrors are illuminated by gas lamps. Here's a a gas supply here, and here's the lamp, and it's focused on the mirror, and the mirror the light from the mirror reflects on into the box here where this photographically sensitive paper is on a rotating drum, which rotates once a an hour or something like that by clockwork, and you understand that at this time there was no electricity no there was no electronics and so this recording was done entirely by what we call analog techniques and mechanical uh you know crude not crude very delicate and wonderful mechanical things uh, without the benefit of amplifiers or ccds or anything uh, fancy and it, it all worked uh, remarkably well the uh the actually the numbers 
associated with these deflections are well calibrated in terms of uh, the way you measure magnetic field, which is Tesla's or 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 whatever Gauss's or gammas or whatever units you wish to use. So this uh, record, this amazing device, and there were two of them. There was one in at Greenwich as well. They recorded the um, the perturb this SFE we call it solar flare effect. And here I will sneer at the astronomers because it used to be called a crotchet, which is kind of a nice, colorful name, and now it's it's called by an acronym by a three letter acronym, uh, uh, the solar flare effect. Boring, I think, but but nevertheless, nevertheless, um, that's it. And this is a modern one. This is a an example of a magnetic a geomagnetic uh, deflection. I think you probably can see. You can't see which it is, but in this blown up version here, the I believe the light gray line is the geomagnetic effect, and it's comparing itself here with uh, soft X-rays coming from the sun and and other other solar radiations, and so it's a very exact timing. So now we have modern data, which is why I have picked this uh, problem up again to try to calibrate uh, calibrate the the original Carrington observations or the original magnetic observations of the Carrington event. And so we can see how big it was in modern terms. And that's what this talk is about, of course, because if it's a Carrington event, it's a, a very powerful flare. If it happened again, what would be the result? If something more powerful than the Carrington class of event happened, uh, would it really be injurious to, to civilization in some serious way? Okay, so the answer, I mean, do these things occur? Yes, they do. Uh, these aurorae seen in, at southern latitudes uh, go back to Roman times, at least, or maybe Babylonian times, where, where you the sky would turn red. And this is a, a drawing that was made in Japan, in Nagoya, uh, in, in 1770. Uh, and this time, of course, Japan was closed, totally closed to European society, but they were... Uh, still diligently making records and uh, they were being baffled by this appearance of these rays, red rays. Uh, and the latitude of Nagoya is about 30 or maybe less than 30 degrees. So this is very far south. And uh, just as, as a personal aside, uh, here in Glasgow, just uh, last month, about a month ago, uh, we had an aurora which uh, my iPhone could catch a picture of a very nice uh, red rays uh, out my living room window. So, so, but of course we're at 55 degrees in Glasgow. And so we don't see aurora uh, more than once or twice a, uh, per solar cycle, you know, every decade or something like that. But in this case, it was quite nice. Okay. So now the bit of physics here. Uh, so, so what if you have the Carrington flare, how much energy is involved? And the, uh, it's easy to calculate that because Carrington said the flare was as bright as the sun itself. So let's say it doubles the solar brightness and he saw how big it was. It was what uh, we infer to be a hundred millionths of the solar hemisphere. That's a measure. So like 0.01% uh, of the whole disk of the sun and it lasted for about five minutes. So put those numbers together and you get this number of ergs. And there, if there were a CME at that time, and uh, we we know there was actually because we saw the geomagnetic storm uh, associated with this flare, and that would have a comparable amount of energy as well, and a mass of ten to the sixteenth or ten to the seventeenth grams. So this uh, uh, amount of energy is very large, of course, and the amount of mass is very large. In fact, it's roughly the amount of mass is roughly the uh, the mass of Tucson, you know, digging down in the ground for you know a few hundred meters let's say, or yeah, a few hundred meters, then launching it into space, uh, uh, that is, that's about the mass of the ICME if, I, if my, the back of my envelope does not lie. So it's large. And so this mass uh, goes out in, into infinity. So that's obviously a lots of energy. And so the total energy, you might add those up and get this. And uh, the, the problem is you can do this estimate now and get this number, which is an important number for comparing with uh, consequences, uh, geo-effectiveness. And Carrington could have made this estimate, but of course the ERG hadn't even been invented by then, uh, for example. So 
he would not have uh, been thinking along these lines particularly. And the leading physicist of the day, Lord Kelvin, was poo-pooing the whole idea in the first place uh, on, it turned out, incorrect grounds. Okay, so I wouldn't want to give a talk like this without showing you a movie. So this is one of my favorites. This is a flare uh, sequence that was taken uh, by the uh, SDO satellite, no, the, the uh, this, what was it called? The uh, um, 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 trace satellite in, in 2001. And it's another EUV measurement. This is an image in the EUV. It's bright where the plasma in the in the corona is uh, ten million is about a million degrees, something like that, like a million Kelvin. And this is a very uh, high resolution image. You can see the sun here. This arc is the limb of the sun. So the uh, what we're looking at is uh, you know just a an arc minute or a few arc minutes across. And what you see, of course, is uh, stru uh, structures. Uh, these are filamentary structures that are the magnetic field containing plasma. And this is hot plasma. Hot material exists, emits you know, radiation. It emits this kind of radiation. And so you can see all kinds of structures here that the magnetic field is supporting and allowing to radiate. And then when a flare happens, the structure changes. Okay, And it changes because it's in the process of releasing this magnetic energy that's that's stored in the field itself and converting it into heat and, and light and particles and stuff like that. So the movie is all play out goes for about six hours, I think, in real time. And it's accelerated, of course. And you can see at the beginning uh, this picture, and then you can see what happens. So watch, uh, watch it, please. Note how the corona disappears, how it gets black out there. That's the mass ejection happening. And then you can see these things growing here, leaf and lurches, because each lurch is about one orbit of the satellite, an hour and a half, something like that. And eventually you find all these uh, arcade, what we call arcades and loops, bright loops that have formed here. But as you saw during the progression, there was a, a sudden shrinkage of the field. Uh, I'll, I'll play it again so you'll see the, the structures that are there at the beginning collapse a little bit. So watch for that and watch for the dimming. So the implosion and then the dimming are the two characteristics of this movie, which I like a lot. Okay, there's the implosion, there's the dimming, and then there's the flare itself. And now the CME is, is history, the CME is on its way to the Earth, except in this case, the flare is at the limb of the sun, so the CME is going uh, orthogonally. Okay, so that movie, is that a nice movie? Uh, I think it is a nice movie. Okay, so question, how dangerous? Yes, yes it's a nice movie. <laughs> okay. okay. And Bob may be joining us soon. He was at the store. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, all right, so the question is, so that's so what you see the flare, how dangerous can this kind of thing be? And the answer to that is, uh, depends upon... Uh, how how flares are distributed in energy or in magnitude. And so just, just like earthquakes uh, with the Richter scale, there is a distribution of magnitudes and it is a power law, meaning that there are lots of small ones and very few large ones. But like the Richter scale, the power law uh, could be thought to be open-ended. I mean, there's no theory for this. It is just what we observe. Open-ended means that there's no known limit uh, at the at the large end, and so uh, there could be a very 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 big event, and so the the the, uh, the key there to whether there could be such an event is to look at this to define this power law, to characterize it, and to see if it does go uh, in such a way that you can extrapolate it to the biggest possible events, and so that uh, has been done, and so there is this power law you can see is. Quite a nice one. This is a earlier view of it. Solar flare frequency, number of flares per unit time. How many per per day, per per year, per month, something like that, and as a function of the peak energy. And you can see that over many orders of magnitude, uh, maybe five orders of magnitude in energy, it's a very solid power law. So this distribution is very different from a random occurrence. 
in a random occurrence, you get the bell curve, which is a Gaussian, and uh, it has uh, the vanishingly high, vanishingly large probability for large and small events. This kind of distribution doesn't. It has uh, a huge probability of low for low, uh, un undefinably large probability for small events, and also the possibility for large events if you extrapolate this. So the question mark here is because the, this data set was not really adequate to define the long time scales that correspond to the occurrence of the biggest events. So just recently, uh, we have uh, redone this. Uh, we've recalibrated the, you know, the standard measurement now of the, of the soft X-rays of the sun. We've drawn this power law, same power law uh, that you see here in such a manner that it can be extrapolated. And so now we know, in fact, that this particular characteristic of a polar, the soft X-ray emission, does have a upper limit. I mean, it rolls over. So this is a bit disappointing if you're a Carrington event uh, fan, because it means that uh, if this aspect of the flare probably does not occur, uh, this rollover here is consistent with Carrington's own observation, but it implies that if you go to very long time scales, there will be uh, fewer and fewer events. So uh, that is uh, the end of the story for the Carrington event, in a sense. Uh, and just to reiterate that, there are earthquakes, all kinds of things show these power law distributions. For instance, if you if you calculate the frequency of occurrence of words in the Bible or any piece of text, uh, you will get a power law. And so this the power law has got different names in different fields, that it's a very, very uh, frequent uh, pattern for nat natural phenomena. And as, as I said, based upon this, we can could I, easily- Could I ask something at this point? Because yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Are you comparing it to word frequency? And now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the, the name for the distribution there, I'm forgetting what it is actually, but there is a particular name for this kind of power law. Concordance is the is the word for the uh, tabulation of the word occurrence, I think. But the name of the distribution is, is a funny one, and I don't remember it. I'm sorry. Okay, so, however, the power law, maybe not the whole story. I mean, it, it certainly describes uh, flares as we observe them currently, because we have so much data, right? And so we know uh, about the physics of these pretty well. But there could be something we don't know. And so that something else is sometimes called a dragon king. And I don't know where in the world this name came from, uh, but it's something which is not predictable. <laughs> so, so it may sound like a tautology, but uh, if, uh, if something happens which you had not expected, it, it would be a dragon king if it were important. So you, you, when you're thinking about the, about the risks of a... Of an, of an occurrence, a, a phenomenon, uh, you mustn't stop uh, without allowing for the possibility that something you don't know is going to happen. Who was our politician who talked about known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns? Uh, this is the, the latter category, I think. Okay, so the, the black, black swan terminology is sort of very popular. Black swans, of course, were discovered in Australia by the Europeans uh, who thought they were all swans were white, because in England uh, all swans were white, but they found to their amazement that there were black swans. And so that was a, if you had predicted based upon the population of swans in the UK, uh, what the color of swans in Australia would be, you would have predicted white because that's all you knew. So, but there are black ones. And so that was uh, an example of a dragon king, I guess. And here's a picture of a dragon king uh, gotten directly from the web. Uh, I'm not sure why I got that one, but it looks fierce. So uh, we, uh, are, to, sum to summarize, we have to think of other ways for solar disasters to occur uh, in addition to the known electromagnetic kinds of things that Carrington found. And uh, to sum that up, there's a, a theoretical paper by Olanier et al. in 2013. I don't like this paper at all, but the cartoon is, is a very vivid, and it shows the uh, flares as sort of double 
double bumps here uh, schematically and with the energies labeled here. Here's the, the Carrington energy here. And the point of this paper was, if you give me a big enough sunspot, I will give you a big super flare. And so it, if you just sort of take a, get a, a spot that's a thousand times bigger, you'll get a thousand times more energy from its flaring. So end of story, I think, on that regard. However, uh, just like with the black swans and with the uh, dragon kings, something happened in 2012 because this graduate student here in Japan uh, looking at tree rings, and this is a tree ring from a, a, a Japanese uh, cedar tree, a very old cedar tree a relic uh, from the island of uh, uh, what is the name of the island? Southern, off the southern coast of Ireland, a place that is notorious for rainforests and big old trees. And so this is a big old tree. And so what she did was measure carbon 14 in the tree rings. This had been done many times before. And I, do people understand, roughly speaking, what carbon 14 dating involves? I think it's okay of the carbon 14 add on over time, right? As it gets less and less radioactive. That's right. That's right. So the, the carbon 14 is an isotope of, of the carbon atom, which is formed only when something uh, nuclear happens. Right, so a nuclear process like a cosmic ray uh, hitting another nucleus and making uh, another, you know, a, a, a carbon-14, not a carbon-12, which is the normal isotope, but the carbon-14. So it can be made, and then once it's embedded, once it's taken up by the, by the tree, uh, then it's there frozen in time, and it's decaying according to its half-life. So because we know its half-life, we can uh, estimate how old the material is in the tree. And so radially, going out radially along the rings of this, of this tree, presumably you would measure more and more carbon-14 if it were being made systematically all the time. But if it were made, if it were made suddenly, impulsively, by, a, by an event, then you would see a spike. And that's what she found. She was able to do not annual uh, tree rings, sorry, not not long integrations like eleven year solar cycle kinds of integrations, but annual integrations, and it's hard to do that from the counting from the counting instrumentation point of view. It's expensive and difficult uh, because as carbon fourteen decays, it, it it gets fainter and fainter, and uh, the time series gets harder and harder to distinguish. But she was able to do the time series for seven seventy five A.D. in a tree like this. And she found a super flare. And there's the picture of the, there's the, the graph of carbon-14 parts per thousand uh, going along at a normal rate, and then suddenly jumping up at about 775 AD. This is one year per, per tick mark. And uh, it wasn't just her cedar trees, but people immediately glommed onto oak trees from, and cowrie trees from New Zealand and, and trees from all over the world. And they found always found the same effect. And so this uh, was a global thing that happened. And that's an important consideration because uh, the uh, global character means it's more likely to be solar in origin than, than something astronomical but not solar, such as a, a nearby supernova that nobody else had noticed. So this phenomenon uh, could very well be a solar flare okay, or something like a solar flare. But upon study, um, people, I don't think I'll talk about this in detail, but upon study, people found that this was so, okay, I got to talk about it a little bit. So this is the mechanism here we're talking about here is that the flare happens, the CME results from the flare, the CME accelerates solar cosmic rays. This is all well-known uh, phenomenology. These solar cosmic rays come to the Earth, uh, make carbon-14, the tree the, the trees grow, and then the, the, the girl comes along and measures the, the, the time series. So the, uh, the connection is a, a complicated chain of circumstances which links the tree ring concentration of carbon-14 to flare occurrence. That's how it should work. But if you, if you look at the amount of energy required to make 
the CME that could make the cosmic rays that could make the tree rings uh, have as much carbon-14 as she found, you find that it's a, it's a much larger amount of energy than the Carrington flare itself had, right? And so we're looking at a flare, at, at a, a, a thing that happened in, 990, in 775 AD. So that's about, a, let's say, 1,500 years ago. Well, Carrington was 100, what, 160 years ago? So this is a, on a time scale that's maybe order of magnitude longer, uh, 1,500, 1,300 years, something like that. So this could be, uh, in principle, just the less frequent, but still physically similar Carrington kind of event happening. Uh, however, uh, inspired by what she did, people have looked harder now at, at uh, the tree rings across the whole of the, of the Holocene, so 10,000 years, and they found half a dozen, eight or 10 events of this sort, all about the same brightness. A bit strange, and so uh, this, the distribution function for the for the cosmic ray fluence, you know, the amount number of particles that the sun had to produce to to make these tree ring events, uh, when combined with lunar data on the moon, on the moon you've got cosmic ray tracks that you can in, interpret in terms of solar cosmic rays. Very, this is all pretty pretty uh, arcane, I have to admit, but this putting it all together allowed uh, this fellow Usoskin to conclude that, yes, there's a rollover in the, in the magnitudes of the solar cosmic rays as well. And so this uh, circumstantial evidence is pretty indirect evidence, but it's the same kind of complicated story you often see in astronomy where you are li limited to 2D, as I said, to live 2D or not 2D. Uh, you don't really know what's going on. You just have to let the phenomenology explain it to you as best you can. And sometimes it requires a, an elaborate song and dance kind of uh, combination of, of theory and speculation and modeling to, to get the answer. So the threat assessment, uh, we can interpret in the following way. Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. Um, sure. I have a question. When you, because my husband may want to know, he, he's still unpacking. Um, combining with the lunar data, data, and you said some kind of tracks, what were they called? Solar tracks? Well, they're cosmic ray tracks. They're, they're cosmic ray tracks. Okay. Yeah. Well, like, and, okay. And what, what happens is the cosmic ray goes into a solid substance and it, it leaves a trail of ionization. And so that's a clearly demarcated. And so if you were very careful with preparing, slices of rocks and lunar rocks. So you have to go to the moon and get them. Then you can see these tracks uh, and they kind of integrate the cosmic ray history um, of that of that exposed piece of, of soil, lunar soil. That's why I say it's arcane because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, imprecise uh, assumption that goes into a, a lot of this stuff, but it's pretty solid in the sense that the tracks are really there and the sun really makes cosmic rays and really one can do, roughly speaking, quantitative work with this. Enough in any way for us to assess threat. So uh, the bottom line uh, here is that uh, A, Carrington events probably don't pose much of a threat from the physics that we understand, but B, there's physics that we don't understand that produces these uh, Miyake events. This is uh, her name, Miyake. So we, we call them Miyake events. Um, yeah, I think the island actually was Yakushima, uh, maybe, or Yakushima, something like that. So yeah, so Miyake events uh, are a threat because they could happen, and we see them happening, you know, once once a millennium, like something like that. And we don't know what they are like physically because, uh, and so there there could be risk involved in, in uh, geoeffective results from these from these events. And just as a footnote, uh, these tree ring events don't coincide with known Carrington type flares, huge huge solar flares in the in the current epoch, right? For the last hundred years, last fifty years, let's say. Uh, well, not the last fifty years, but the here's another problem. Prior to 1950, something like that, we've known about big flares, but the uh, the tree rings now are all contaminated by by uh, nuclear bomb testing, 
So the carbon-14 is, is huge amounts of carbon-14 are produced if you set off an atomic bomb in the, in the Earth's atmosphere. And we are stuck stuck with that because we uh, the triggering record is the current triggering record is not so good. Okay, so okay, so then the next next question is what what do we do if we want to have a disaster that is of solar origin? So at this point, I'm switching gears, and I'm going to talk a little. I'm going to speculate about about. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about stellar observations and stuff like that, and then I will. Uh, speculate about weird things right so if if you're happy if, are you if you have questions about the sun itself uh you know in areas that i've talked about or, or could talk about please ask um, i'll give you a second here and then we're going to go off into yeah. i have one question right in the approximately 11 year solar cycle when was the character event in that cycle at the peak right uh, it was not far from the peak actually so uh yeah that's a perfectly good question uh, the the, uh, the thing is though yeah so so uh this 11 year cycle is at its peak right now and uh, we're getting all kinds of big flares right now it's really for for me it's a lot of fun uh, so this is the <laughs> the time when we could get a super duper flare and i've got a I'm always running this real-time data, you know, hoping, hoping, not really hoping, but uh, uh, yeah, hoping there's going to be a super flare I can study. So yes, yeah, near solar maximum, but sometimes the biggest events don't happen uh, at solar maximum. There are so few that it's hard to pin down the phases. And uh, the uh, I'll mention this in the context of stellar flares in a second. In the case of the sun, a few of the biggest solar flare events, not at quite at the Carrington level, but a factor of two or three down, have occurred at the end of a solar cycle. So what I call the, the last best sunspot group appears. There was one in 1997, for example. There was one in 2017, for example. Uh, right at the end of the cycle, uh, a huge event may happen. So uh, the problem is one doesn't really have enough statistics for these for these rare big events. More questions about the sun? Okay. So feel free to ask, but I'll launch into this, the rest of this now. And so the rest of this leads us to the stars. Of course, the, what you do if you're stuck for, a, <clears throat> stuck for a third dimension is you use the time domain or you use other kinds of statistical techniques to be an astronomer and to learn about uh, the sun. And so what we can do is look at sun-like stars, solar type stars, and look at their flares and try to understand the, how their flares work and see if we can not uh, graph that into uh, our understanding of the sun. So this is an example of a, of a, a flare star, a flaring star. And you can see it's the brightness in fractional units, right? So this is a tenth as bright as the star, a tenth of the brightness. Here's the star itself going along, being bright and faint in a kind of a sinusoidal pattern. And on top of that, there are these spikes. And these spikes are flares, of course, and they're huge flares. So you can see that they're at the 10% level, not the 0.01% level that Carrington saw, but at the 10% level, this star is basically disappearing and, and becoming a thousand times brighter, right? So it's really quite a remarkable thing that these things happen. And they're happening on, according to Mai Hara, the author of this paper, they're happening on solar type stars. So solar type star means that it's the size of the sun and the, maybe the age of the sun and the, and the chemical composition of the sun and the, uh, uh, the gravity of the sun, all these different different temperature of the sun, all these different things make them, make them sun-like and rotating at the solar rate. All right, the sun, it turns out, rotates only once a month, uh, whereas most stars rotate faster than that. And this star, in fact, is rotating about uh, with about a five-day period. You can see that the peaks are about five Julian days apart. Uh, Julian days are how astronomers count, count years, days. And so there, there's five of them, five days. Uh, so 25 days would be the solar kind of analog. 
All right, so in the case of the sun, this is what you see on a first star. In the case of the sun, what you see is a very different time scale here. This is like three or four months. You see actually dips. You don't see flares. You see de decreases of brightness. And these decreases of brightness are quite small. They're not as big as those flares. Uh, and they're caused by sunspots. The sunspot is black. And so when the sunspot goes across the face of the sun, the solar brightness decreases. So the sun is dippy and the spots and the stars are flary. Uh, so it's a case of flariness versus dippiness. And uh, this is a problem because it, what it means is that it's very hard to go out in the dark sky and see stars that are truly solar-like uh, in all of those different parameters that I spoke of, specifically in particular, the rotation rate. And so uh, this is a, kind of a dead end, although it's very interesting that these stars can make these super duper flares. And so this could very well be linked uh, in some way to the Miyake phenomenon. And uh, this is why it's important to do these uh, observations of the stars, because we may learn clues about the physics of some different thing, not, not a solar not a Carrington type physics, but a different kind of physics that would be in the category of this, um, this Dragon King kind of thing. And this is just a technical slide about that. So this summarizes that. Uh, what we've learned, this is also fairly prosaic. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but I will comment about this. This is a very nice thing uh, that has happened recently. And so the uh, thing is that in the case of the sun, it's easy to observe coronal mass ejections because you can make a, an image, a coronagraph image, and you can see it happening. The, the material flies away from the sun and you can resolve it. In the case of a star, mainly what you've got is a point of light and you can't do anything with it. And so a CME could happen and you wouldn't know. And so this is the CME is the mechanism for <clears throat> geoeffectiveness. And it's the source of these cosmic rays, solar cosmic rays that could cause these tree ring events, the Miyake events. Uh, it's very important to, to find proxy ways of seeing uh, stellar CMEs. And this is an example. If you have a, a the ultraviolet spectrum, extreme ultraviolet spectrum between 10 and 30 nanometers. Uh, this is 100 to 300 angstroms. And sunlight is like at 5,000 angstroms. So this is at, at wavelengths that are, you know, 10th or 100th of the, the wavelength of visible light. So the sun is very dark at these wavelengths, <clears throat> but still the corona emits, emits them. And so if you make a, a difference image for sunlight during a flare, in this wavelength range, you get a, the red line normally before the flare. Then when the flare happens, you get this black line, lots of lots of signal. If you make a difference, then you get the this these the blue line where you see it looks like absorption lines. So these hot these lines uh, correspond to different temperatures, roughly speaking, and they the sun gets dim uh, when these uh, high temperature lines uh, are observed during a CME. It's a dimming, and uh, it's a spectral signature of a dimming. And so with this spectral signature, it should be possible to, to look at a flare, look at the, a star, especially nearby ones like uh, Proxima Centauri, uh, and uh, you know one of the famous ones that you might know about, and uh, see the CME is happening just from the EUV proxy. The problem is that you need pretty big optics to be able to do this, and stellar Flare observations are not the kind of sexiest astronomy, so it's the hardest to, to sell uh, to the funding agencies. So there isn't an instrument that can do this right now, but there may be in the future because it looks like, because par partially because of exobiology and the, the, you know, the passion people have for, for seeing uh, exoplanets and you know, reigniting the idea of life on other systems, uh, with the CMEs as a possible, you know, counter counter argument against the possibility of life. If you have lots of CMEs from super duper flares, super duper CMEs, it might make it hard for life to initiate.
So just, just in the world of speculation, that's happening. Okay. So uh, just wanted to throw this in because it's kind of mathematics that I don't know much about, but uh, I know the names of things. Invented by Poincaré, French mathematician from the 19th century. Not a, some years after, some years after Carrington, maybe 50 years after, he invented uh, chaos. Well, he invented the mathematical description of chaos, right? And chaos, in this sense, is a solution to differential equations, uh, which are physical explanations for the processes in the framework of what he called dynamical systems. And the dynamical systems uh, are like, in a sense, a pendulum is a, is a, system, a dynam dynamical system. It swings back and forth very stably. If you have two pendulums that are connected by a spring between them, then you get unpredictable behavior. Uh, don't ask me why, but you can describe it by these uh, curves in parameter space. Normally, a system will be stable, but that every now and then, like a rogue wave, you'll see this fantastic uh, eccentricity, an unpredicted uh, thing that happens. And so this is an example of the mathematics of what you might call a dragon king. Uh, the system goes into a totally different state spontaneously uh, and in a, in a manner that cannot be predicted. Uh, I have to say that over again. Uh, so that the mathematical support for that does exist. And so the physics maybe is not quite there and missing. And this just says Dragon King in Chinese, if you're curious. Okay. Um, in the 19th century, just for, for just because it's a nice coincidence, the Carrington event probably had a CME of about 10 to the 17th grams. And all it did actually at the earth was to create uh, surges of earth current. And uh, it was detected readily in, in telegraph systems around the world at that time, because these earth currents would uh, flow along the telegraph cables and make sparks and <laughs> cause fires. So there's some some uh, uh, description. This was done by Loomis of, of the things that were happening like that. The, the, so a few singed beards resulted from the Carrington flare. Of course, uh, the geoeffectiveness of flares is is more modern. More modern big flares has been very expensive. Flares have happened, and you've seen power outages. The famous one in New York from the Hydro Quebec system. Uh, from the 80s, I guess, and later. And then there's, of course, nowadays we've got lots of satellites out there and they're, they're exposed to solar radiation in a way that we're not exposed on the Earth. And so it's, it's entirely conceivable to, to eliminate, uh, you know, to, to, to destroy the, function, the functioning of all of these spacecraft simply by having enough high energy particles. And so that would be a, a, not a a threat to the human race, but it would be an amazing uh, disruption and it would cause huge, huge pain and suffering. And it could be imagined, it could easily be imagined, actually. And even at the Carrington flare level, uh, we often exaggerate the geoeffect, uh, we, we solar astronomers often tr exaggerate the, the geoeffectiveness of these flares in order to attract research funds and inter public interest. But uh, the, it is not a joke, and uh, it's not. It, it can be exaggerated safely, uh, just like global warming can be exaggerated safely. Uh, it could, it's it's a very serious matter, and there is a on record a British uh, agency which has estimated the the cost of a Carrington flare now, a Carrington double flare, just that Carrington flare. If it happened now, uh, it could possibly cost cause a. Earth-based damage of, of uh, in the trillion dollar range. And of course, the satellite fleet is worth a lot of money and it would take many years to re reproduce. So uh, at the same time in the 19th century, we had the Carrington event, which was this amount of mass in the heliosphere. We also had a big volcano, uh, the Tambora, which was estimated to have injected about the same mass into the stratosphere. and. <laughs> So this was a horrible disaster. Uh, tidal waves in the in, in winter. The, the Europe had uh, uh, years with with no winter, with no summer. Right, uh, just no crops. 
grew. And so and countless fatalities resulted from this Tambora eruption. So just to compare, it depends upon where you're putting your energy. Okay, so as a, as a preparation for this discussion tonight uh, or to today, I've actually forced myself to look at the all the solar disaster movies I could see on YouTube. And this is a list of them here, uh, starting with Cat 8, one called Solar Flare, Solar Attack, Solar Impact, Solar Crisis, and the end of the world. And I got my own personal rating for these was generally pretty awful. And I, you know, of course, I'm a professional astronomer and I see what they're saying and I, I, I know when they're faking it. So I don't want to be too critical because they have to, you know, make a movie. But I will say one thing that's really ludicrous in, in most of these movies is the depiction of this, what happens to satellites, Earth satellites. What happens in the movie, movies tends to be that you see this fire coming from the sun, the CME, it's blazing hot and it hits these satellites. And just like a duck that has been shot with a shotgun, it flutters down, it flutters down to the Earth, uh, dead duck uh satellite gone but that's not what would happen of course because the satellite's up there in orbit and, and it's going to stay in orbit whether it's alive or dead and it's not going to flutter to the ground it's <laughs> so all it can do is turn off uh and its momentum and its energy will stay there for the foreseeable future so that's the only uh that's one of the things you might watch for if you see a, a bad movie i thought the one called solar crisis was actually pretty good this had uh, big stars in it like Jack Palance. And so I actually gave it a five out of 10. So uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this to anybody else. I just did it for, to try to catch up a little bit on the world of science fiction. And I, I've I also have been trying to, oh. a question yes. for you. I wonder if um, in any of these movies or any of your other research, if um, the effect of solar flares or Miyake events or any of these solar events um, are, is there any data on what happens to humans? Um, like, not just dying, but um, solar flares of anger. I've heard of... Um, physiological effects? Physiological effects, interpersonal effects, yeah. Um, social oh, uprising. Yeah, well, <laughs> I suppose there's been some work. I don't know about it, but of course the sociology of the... In the Carrington event, there were the, these telegraph disasters, and that's, that's got to have caused some, some stress. Uh, the um, direct physiological effect, I don't think anything is there. So it would all, it would have to be a- There is. There is? Yeah, there's, there's evidence of, for example, increased uh, number of heart attacks during geomagnetic storms. Ah, okay, that sort of thing. Maybe so, yeah. So the, we are electromechanical systems, right? Or electrochemical. So it, it, there could, there could, I wouldn't want to say no. And when the solar, when a big uh, magnetic storm happens, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to say no. I would, I, I tend to dismiss the idea of power, uh, power transmission lines causing cancer, but as, there are certainly mechanisms that you could imagine. And statistical tests, you well, but you know these statistics better than I do. So, but uh, that wouldn't be a major thing that we. So, I think the more more important thing would be the 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 uh, uh, social consequences if there were if these GPS went out, for example, and we couldn't fly airplanes, and the 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 kinds of stress on humanity that would result from a year's absence of, of satellites. I think that would be a social a social thing, which would be horrible. And I, su I suspect there have been studies of this because uh, it's, such a, it's such a possibility. In that regard, the effects of a solar flare on, on the social level are like transformers blow out, um, satellites can't function or they like crash. What, what are all of the effects of a solar flare, what do you think? I mean, do computers work anymore? Well, the, uh, computers, if there were an elect, so if I don't know if anybody saw Ocean's Eleven, the, the movie, there was an uh, EMP that was the featured, the featured uh, techie thing in that movie, uh, electromagnetic pulse, right? Not, not a pulse uh, like a geomagnetic storm at that level, which is, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the, of the magnetic field of the earth, but a huge magnetic field that can be made by a, 
by an electromagnetic uh, disturbance at the Earth. And so in the movie, uh, they set one off in Las Vegas, and its immediate reaction was to turn off all the lights, uh, blow out all the transformers uh, in the in the county. And so uh, a localized effect, an EMP. And you could imagine, this is in fact my list of disasters that's going to come up soon, we'll have EMPs as a as a global possibility. So the uh, the thing that could take out the satellites uh, could very well just be a very, very large EMP. And that kind of a electromagnetic pulse, of course, it would uh, presumably do a number on, on people with pacemakers and uh, people with with metal uh, fittings in their, you know, supporting their skeleton, for example. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that a very strong electromagnetic pulse could cause havoc. The fillings of your teeth would fly out, something like that. So uh, I'm not a, a medical person. I don't uh, know how true any of this is, but if you have huge magnetic fields, uh, it can be tough. And I've been, for instance, to places where the strong, fields are strong, and you're requested when you go to these terrestrial laboratories where there are strong magnetic fields you're for instance requested to leave your keys out of your pocket and, and take your sun, take your glasses off and stuff like that so uh, things can happen and uh let me get get to my next slide i may have some of them uh yeah i just wanted to mention too about books in addition to movies uh i've been trying to read but i have so little time I've only read you know one or two recent books. I read uh, the Ministry of the Future by uh, Kim Stanley Anderson, for example. Uh, and I like that. I'm reading a book by one of, one of Arthur C. Clarke's most recent, well, latest books. Last he died shortly after this, I think, called Sunstorm, which I thought was awful when I first picked it up, but then I realized that probably the awful part was uh, Baxter. Uh, the second half of the book is really great. And it has all kinds of nice uh, speculation about physically plausible ways that the sun could could go wrong. And I'll talk about that a little bit now. Um, okay, that's my conclusions for the first part. All right, so the solar disaster menu. Uh, I think the first bullet number one is uh, Super Carrington. I think we, we can do the statistics for this and we can dismiss it as a major threat. And I'm sorry for those of you who would like for it not to be, uh, but Carrington deserves credit for, for starting this all off. Okay, the EMP is the very next thing that, that I think about. The EMP, electromagnetic pulse, um, if there were, they're a very small but highly magnetized star, a dwarf M star, and the, and the galaxy is filled with them. If it made a close impact on the sun, we might not see it coming uh, for a long time because these are very faint. Uh, but they are uh, mag magnetic. And so if this very, very, uh, in the smallest of stars is still a massive thing. So if this massive magnetic field, this magnetic field supported by this massive object came close to the sun, let's say inside uh, Mercury's orbit, then I, I don't know how uh, strong the electromagnetic pulse would be at Earth, but it could be arbitrarily large, I think. And so this, would be a thing that could happen, and uh, the uh, the only reason not to suspect that we should worry about this is that we can do the statistics. We can we can measure the stellar population of the galaxy. We can estimate how frequently this can be, and it's not not going to be very frequent. And so we are in what I I think of as the uh, conspiracy theory trap, namely. Conspiracy theory requires a coincidence, right? That is bizarre. Uh, in, in this case, the, the conspiracy is the presence of us on Earth, human beings, you know, for a few hundred thousand years, maybe, and the age of the sun being five billion years. Why, if this thing sort of thing can happen, would it choose to happen just when we're here? So it's very vanishingly probable. And so even if, if you could do the statistics and show that it could happen, uh, it still would be vanishingly probable simply uh, because it's a coincidence. So a lot of the worries that you have for the strange uh, solar disasters fall in that category, I think, that, that you have to have 
uh, strange things simultaneously happening, not rare things happening simultaneously, and so doubly rare, or, or the product of rare probabilities. Okay, so that's one such thing. Another such thing is uh, deep penetration by a, a dead vertical uh, inert object. Uh, there are these orphan planets out there in dead in dark space, or you know. The, a, a substellar object, the brown dwarf, or something like that. If one happened to go directly into the sun uh, without uh, missing it, right, then you would have a huge hydrodynamic effect on the star. And this is uh, discussed uh, at great length in this Clark and Baxter book in 2005, the novel Sunstorm. Uh, so the uh, that is certainly not uh, impossible, actually. Then a, a, a weird thing that one could imagine, I don't think it's very likely, is that there is intelligence in the sun, sentience, right? And there's some science fiction novels about this. There's a, uh, David Brin, I guess, and, and a, a sun, sun diver. They, people go close to the sun and there's a couple of spacecrafts that can somehow resist solar radiation. <clears throat> Uh, and it it sees things that are anim, anim, animated, and there are there are animals out there in the solar corona that are eating magnetic field, getting their energy from the magnetic field, and they're called <clears throat> magnetovores. Very a great name. So if there are magnetovores, and could there be circulating currents that are allowing these magnetovores to have a persistent memory, like our memory, like our brain, uh, the neurons in our brain can, can uh, or the brain of a, a parakeet or anything can remember for, for years. Uh, could the, could something in a hot medium like the sun actually do that? Well, un, highly unlikely, I think. But if the sun were aware, and we've just reached out to touch it with the Parker Solar Probe, maybe it will be angry. <laughs> so I think this is more of a joke than a possibility. Okay, uh, I mentioned, oh, a question. I just posted on the uh, chat. Can you read my text on the chat? Okay, uh, I'll read it after I stop projecting. There is a paper by Chris Empey from the University of Arizona. Which okay. Is about the plasmas uh, in space. And there's a lot of evidence uh, to support that theory. Now. And okay. The conclusion that Chris comes to is that uh, more research is needed. And so I think he looking for some grant money. All right. So I'll check that out. And uh, thank you very much. This is actually why I'm enjoying this, uh, because I think uh, I'd like to get feedback from you about books I should read and uh, ideas I should I can think more about as uh, since I've gotten interested again. And this is a science fiction. Uh, this is allowing me to re re return to my youth a little bit. OK, so but I do want to discuss this last thing. Which I think is the this is the idea which I think is maybe uh, has not occurred to the science fiction writers in the past, and that is that there, but probably it has. Okay, and the, the idea is that the the sun actually began uh, with the seed mass. In fact, I've got the list of things here that has to happen. Embedded solar black hole. So the idea is that a tiny black hole, primordial, right, and that's already a, a mystery you know, a, a plausible hypothesis that has no support. A tiny black hole forms the initial seed mass for solar accretion. So the sun, the mass of the sun builds up around this black hole. Some of it accretes into the black hole, but because of uh, angular momentum, some of it doesn't. And so eventually a bubble, a hollow bubble is formed at the center of this mass that's accreting. <clears throat> this, the black hole is at the, at the very center. And there's a, ca a cavity, a concentrically spherical cavity around the black hole. And above it, there's just a star, a regular star, which behaves, which evolves like stellar evolution theory, which we know quite well uh, works. And you can think about this as like Pellucidar, if you're familiar with Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is the hollow earth kind of idea, except that the, the, at the center of the hollow earth, uh, there is a black hole. And it's... Uh, <clears throat> behavior, uh, I'm speculating, could be that it, as the sun evolves normally, the accretion from the inner cavity into this black hole increases slowly at first, 
and it's forming uh, gradually forming an accretion disk around the black hole, which is hidden from view, of course, because of the rest of the star, rest of the sun. And uh, this accretion disk uh, has an instability, which allows a sudden the sudden occurrence uh, of a jet. And uh, here, here you want to think about M87 or cosmic jets that are huge, huge and powerful and produce relativistic particles. Supernova remnants have them. M87 is a galaxy that has one. Uh, you know, galaxies with, with supermassive black holes at their at their cores uh, tend to have this jet phenomenon. And so, if if one formed on a smaller scale at the core of the sun, it might actually blow through the body of the sun. And I'm uh, thinking about uh, the movie Alien. The, uh, suddenly, our our beautiful placid uh, solar surface with its granulation and its filaments and its uh, sunspots suddenly this thing comes out of it. And if the inclination, the rotational axis of the black hole were different from the rotation axis of the surface of the sun, which it really could very well be, then it could even blast, just directly be blasting the earth. So I think there are about six different things here, which are wildly speculative and could easily be refuted by an expert on black holes or stellar evolution. But I don't know if anybody has suggested this idea before. So here it is. So with that, uh, I'm finished. Uh, I don't have any more slides. And uh, it has been an hour and a half, I guess. So I'm sorry not to go on. If you have uh, three hours reserved for this, uh, I'm, I'm out of ideas. So we'll just have to have a discussion now. And I will stop sharing and uh, hope for questions because I like to hear them. Well, thank you very much. My husband, Bob, has gotten here, and he's probably not going to say too much because he missed most of the talk, but he caught the last part. Um, so anybody else that wants to give a question, please do. Or questions. Oh, <laughs> Dell, I want to know what questions you have. I don't have any. I <laughs> uh, I don't have any more questions. I'm still curious about whether plasma can exhibit uh, qualities of life or intelligent life. Okay, well, I'm, I see your reference on chat now, so I will uh, check this out for sure. In fact, I will click it now to make sure I don't lose it. So if you look at that paper, it contains links to videos that will bring up videos from YouTube, for example. So they actually have videos of plasma-like entities in space from NASA space shuttle missions. Okay. Okay. I will check this out. I, I was... Uh... I noticed with uh, amazement that uh, in plasmas you can get filamentary filamentary field structures that actually form knots, or like a trefoil knot. Uh, this has been observed in a laboratory, and so we plasmas are among the most mysterious forms of physical matter and long history of people not predicting very well what plasmas do. So I'll look at that with interest. Yes, and somewhat humorously, you can you can hear the space shuttle pilots pointing out these this phenomena that they're seeing right before their eyes. Yeah. And uh, Houston says, uh, uh, "Well, we don't see anything." <laughs> yeah. Okay. So nothing to see here, but. But Chris Impey is on it. So I, I believe that Gloria is going to have Chris Impey as a guest coming up next year. Yes, I am. I'm going to look up what month. Just a minute. I, okay, would, well. <laughs> I would love to hear uh, Chris Impey's uh, progress on this uh, plasma phenomenon. May 3rd, 2025, Chris Impey will be here. Good. Do you know what his topic will be? 
No, but we can we can turn them in this direction. That would be great. We want to thank you, though, for all that you've, it's so 